what our name is going to be when we get to heaven, right? All right. So let's pray, and then we're going to get into the Word. Father, I thank you for your Word. I thank you for who you are. I thank you for just this time to minister to each other, that this Word that you have come forth. I thank you, Father, that it doesn't fall on deaf ears, that it goes, it's sown deep into within us, that, Father, that we are compelled to, to love your word and to desire your word and that your word is the final authority in our lives. That, Father, no matter what our circumstances are, whatever we're feeling or whatever distraction that may be, we thank you, Father, that it falls away. I thank you that we listen to it, that it, does, it is light, it is giving, it is something that empowers us. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> All right, so I like to read. Okay, if you know that about me, I'm, I'm going to constantly tell you guys I read. Um, I pick up books. I have a whole bunch of them ready for the year. I set a goal for me reading this year. Some of you are like, I don't like to read, but you like to scroll on social media. Um, but liking to read. And I love to read, and I love to read the Word. So I'm not one who likes to pick up a lot of fiction books. Okay. I'm not. Um, however, there is this book that I had in my library. It's called Hind's Feet on High Places, and it's a complete allegory. Okay, an allegory is kind of like um, it's an illustration of the word, and I'm going to use all these different illustrations. I'm going to use all these different words for what the word actually is. And it's very fantasy type. Um, and I hated it. I'm just going to tell you. I'm not a fan of that. Okay? But, and I, so what I did is I read the first chapter. I said, oh my goodness, all these names are changed and they're not real names and it's so much allegory. It's so deep in it. I'm going to put it down. I'm going to take it away and I'm not going to read this. You know what? As soon as I did that the next day, there were three instances where I was told to pick it back up. Okay? What is that? That's the Holy Spirit. And there were three different people who mentioned it. I was like, okay, God, I'll pick it back up. And it's okay. It's worked on me. But that's just a little thing of I want you guys to be encouraged that that's what this word is. Sometimes... The word that comes forth, you don't want to hear. And that is what I fought God about, about this word. Because a lot of people don't want to hear it. But it's the word. And I fought God about this message because I said, God, I don't want to beat up people. I don't want to sit there and say that this is what they need, that they're not doing right. But he said, but they haven't got a hold of this part about me yet. It's like, okay, God, I'll keep presenting it. Because I want to tell you the truth. In November, when I brought that word about um, rebuild or tear down, and I encouraged you all to get out there in your community, and I'm going to say that number was, a, a, was pretty bad that showed up that day. My heart broke. I was broken. Because I was like, God, don't they get it? Don't they get? That's what our church is called to do. But he said, it's not that they didn't get your message. They haven't gotten me yet. They haven't gotten that part about who I am. So I kind of broke. I, I, I sat in a point and I was in months of, I just don't want to do it anymore. If they don't want to do it, why should I want to do it? You know how wrong that was? God, I don't, I don't want to schedule these things anymore. What's the point? They don't have a heart for it. He said, but that's not what I told you to do. And I had to repent because you know what I did? I allowed the enemy to steal that joy. I allowed the enemy to take away my desire to see our community reached. And I had to repent before God. It's like, God, I'm sorry. And so that's one of the things that he's brought. And so Pastor John, he's talking about the year of reconciliation. You don't know how excited I am about that. 
Because God's desire is for a man to be reconciled back to him. You know? There was a time where the church was, come so I can be served. That's passed away, guys. We got to get out of that. We got to get out of that mold that I come to church just to hear a word and I go home and I am the exact same person I was when I walked in the door. I've got to get out of that mold of, I don't think there's an importance of going out there and reaching the lost. We've got to get past that. And so that's the year of reconciliation. And Romans 5.10 says, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, it is much more certain, having been reconciled, that we will be saved from the consequences of sin. But his life, that is, will be saved because Christ lives today. Pastor John said that God desired reconciliation the moment there was separation. He desired reconciliation the moment there was separation. What does that mean, really? See, Romans 5, 8 says, But God clearly shows and proves his own love for us by the fact that, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He showed his own love. So, Pastor John said there were three steps. God chose to start the process. God chose to finish the process. But we've got to choose to accept and submit to it. So last week during the um, declaration, we had this declaration because why? Because God has called us to declare his word. And if we don't set this word ahead in front of us, we won't act upon it. So we have to declare his word. And this is what he's told the church to do. That we walk in power because we walk in his spirit. The Holy Spirit is within us. So we walk in power. And we will not see changed lives until we realize that the power dwells in us. And so that's why we have to declare this. And why we declare it over our church every week. I hope you do it every day. I have it in my mirror on my bathroom. I declare it every single day. So I introduced this idea. As part of Ministers in Reconciliation, we have to understand who Jesus is and who we are. Right? So again, I'm going to tell you guys, I'm going to use a lot of scripture. I'm big in scripture. I'm big in the word. Why? Because if it does, I believe that we can come up with ideas that don't line up with the word, but that sounds good. And we become out of line. So I'm going to present a lot of word because I'm going to present this idea, but I'm going to back it up with scripture. And I'm not finding things to twist it. I'm going to sit here and you're going to read it in context. So they're going to have big chunks because I... That's one thing we, we like to do is I like to pick out this part to fit my comfort. But that's not who he is. He tells us he's supposed to, we're supposed to reflect more of him. Yes. Right? Yes. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11 through 20. And I'm going to read in the Amplified Version because that's what I've been reading in. I'm going through a daily reading plan. I'm reading chronologically. And so part of what I've been getting is something I've been reading myself. Um, it says, therefore, since we know the fear of the Lord and understand the importance of obedience and worship. I want to stop right there. The fear of the Lord is not being scared of punishment. The fear of the Lord is, God, I desire to please you. Not because of punishment, but because of love. Fear grounded in love will worship. Fear grounded in punishment will hide. It says, the fear of the Lord and understand the importance of obedience and worship. We persuade people to be reconciled to him. He said persuade. That's not passive word, guys. But we are plainly known to God. He knows everything about us. And I hope that you, uh, and I hope that we are plainly known also in your consciences, your God-given discernment. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but are giving you an occasion to be rightfully proud of us so that you will have an answer for those who take pride in outward appearances, the virtues they pretend to have rather than what is actually in the heart. It's a heart thing. He's going to check. It, it's not ma- merely about just, again, we can have a pride on the outside and do all the things that we need to on the outside, but it's a heart thing. 
So if we are out of our mind, that means that we are unstable fanatics, as some Christians say, it is for God. We could, be a, we could be that way. For if we are in our right mind, it is for your benefit. For the love of Christ controls and compels us because we have concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died, and he died for all. So that all those who live would no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them's sake. Amen. So, he says to live for who? For him. And to die to who? Me. To me. Right? Yeah. Okay. So from now on, we regard no one from a human point of view according to worldly standards and values. From now on, if you're in Christ... You are not to regard anyone from a human point of view. Do you understand what that means? That means that it doesn't matter what they look like. It doesn't matter what they do. It doesn't matter what their background is. You don't value them for that. They are God's created being. That's who they are. So we are supposed to do what? Love them. And I'm going to explain what real love is. It's an action word, yes. not a feeling. It's an action. So it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that is, grafted in, joined to him by faith in him as Savior, he is a new creature, yes. reborn and renewed by the Holy Spirit. Yes. The old things, the previous moral and spiritual condition, has passed away. Behold, new things have become because spiritual awakening brings new life. So if you have a spiritual awakening, you have a new perspective. Right? And here's the thing about your spirit man. You still have your flesh man. And you have to constantly renew. And so what it says is, Pastor John was presenting this idea that you've got to constantly renew this. You've got to constantly accept this sozo life. You've got to constantly do that. So, because spiritual waking brings new life, but all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, making us acceptably him, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, so that by our example, we might bring others to him. Not my bullying, not me presenting of how terrible you are, but by my example is how I bring the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting people's sins against them, but he canceled them out. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation, that is, restoration to favor with God. We all deserve that. Not just us here in Connect Church, but those who are out on the byways, those who are out on the highways, those who are out in the streets, they all deserve God's favor. So we are ambassadors for Christ, as though we are making his appeal through us. We, as Christ's representatives, plead with you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. And if you notice, it says reconciled. It didn't say turn or burn. Please get that out of your vocabulary, that if you do not do right, that you're going to hell. Because those are words of judgment. Please get that as a new creature, as a new Christian, and as a Christian who is showing Christ's love that you never condemn someone to hell because of your convictions. Please, I urge you. It has broken me to where I have lived this life and I had somebody come to me and I disagree. Well, you're just going to hell. And I'm like, well... Who made you king of the universe? Because you definitely aren't. Right? And the thing is, that doesn't show love. To even say, if you don't accept Christ, your promise is hell, doesn't show Christ's love because that's not why he came. I'm sorry, I might have burst your Christian bubble that he didn't come to save us from hell. Because hell was never created for us. It was not created for mankind. Okay? So when we say that, we haven't opened up to who truly Jesus is to us. 
we've limited who he can be. So, he did not come to save us from hell. He came to restore us to purpose, to reconcile us to what our God-given creating was to be. And that was to fellowship with him, to walk with him, to talk with him, to establish his kingdom on earth. Right? So in order to do that, we've got to know who Jesus is. And I love the book of John because in the beginning, in John 1, 1, he tells us, in the beginning, before all time, was the Word. Christ. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God himself. So what is the final authority? It is the Word. It was at the very beginning. It will be at the very end. It will be the final. It'll be, nothing else can exist without that word. He is continually existing in the beginning, co-eternally with God. And all things were made and came into existence through him. Without him, not even one thing was made that has come into being. So everything has to come through the word. Everything has to come through Christ. Everything has to come through Jesus. We can't exist without him. So when I go through this life and this new creation, if I do not establish my relationship with Jesus, I do not have a stable foundation. I'm not going to exist. I'm not going to be able to be that minister of reconciliation because I'm not grounded in the word. All right? And he says, in him was life and the power to bestow life and the life was the light of men. Light. And it's a capital L in the Bible, which means it's a name. Okay? It's not a thing. It is a name. It's a personage. Light. The light shines on in the darkness, and the darkness did not understand it or overpower it or appropriate it or absorb it, and it is unreceptive to it. Light shines on even in the darkness darkness cannot understand it doesn't know how to receive it why verse 9 says there it was the true light the genuine perfect steadfast light which coming into the world enlightens everyone in order for you to work and walk in the ministry of reconciliation you have to accept light because in light is how we bring life. And life without the word is non-existent. And so all of this ties in together. And this is why I, I, it's important for us to know who Jesus is. Jesus is the word. He's my prince of peace. He's my prince of wholeness. That's what I talk about in November. Him being the prince of wholeness. He's also light. He's also light. Luke chapter 8, verses 16 and 18 says, Now no one lights a lamp and then covers it up with a container to hide it or put it under a bed. Instead, he puts it on a lampstand so those who come in may see the light. For there is nothing hidden that will not become evident, nor anything secret that will not be known and come into the open. So be careful how you listen. Be careful how you listen. Be careful how you listen to the word. Be careful how you listen to the enemy. Because whoever has a teachable heart, to him more understanding will be given. And whoever does not have a longing for the truth, what he thinks he was will be taken away from him. So be careful when the enemy tells you that your light needs to be hidden. Because that's not what Jesus said here. Because these are Jesus' words in Luke. I mean, I pay attention when Jesus speaks, right? I'm going to pay attention. Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 and 16 says, You are the light of Christ to the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in his house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good deeds and moral excellence. Oh, wow. Jesus said, shine in such a way that people see what? Your good deeds and moral excellence. Okay? 
Uh, let me go ahead and let you know that my voice is because of a sinus infection. I do not have COVID. Okay. I have been tested. I am negative. It's a sinus infection. Uh, I lost my voice Wednesday, so I'm coming over that. So just look, any qualms or questions, because I did have a little coughing fit up here during praise and worship. It's just because I have drainage going on. <laughs> but, you know, that's what happens. That's why I, it's a good thing why I don't sing, right? Because that would be terrible. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't get the gift of singing either, so I'm not even going to attempt it. Um, so I'm going to bless you guys with that. Uh, so it says, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good deeds and moral excellence. They may see my what? My good deeds and moral excellence. Can you do that if the light is not shining in you? No. But he says, why does he say that? Because they can recognize and honor and glorify your Father who is in heaven. I yes. do this because I want to glorify him. Yes. Right? Yes. So we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. We have to understand that the light through the word has been given to us. It is a lack of confidence in who we are that causes us to question this. Yes. One of the things, and God's already given me the word that I'm supposed to speak for Mother's Day. No, I did not go ahead and present it. Why? Because he says that's for Mother's Day. Yeah. Why? But here's the thing. A little thing. We have to be authentic. Amen. And admit when you don't have confidence. Don't allow pride to rise up in you and get mad when the word presents something else. Okay? He says... We have to understand that the light through the word has given to us. It's a lack of confidence who we are that causes the question that. Satan cares about you not walking in your purpose. He heavily cares about that. He does not want you walking in your purpose. Okay? Can you have confidence if you think that you do not matter? Can you have confidence if you think you don't matter? No, you can't. That's a lack of confidence if you think you, your presence here doesn't matter. I don't have to sit in service. It really doesn't matter. You're an anointed vessel. It matters. You have taken a part away from us. So let me tell you a little bit about being seen. And this is what the title of my message is. You were seen. You were seen. Do you know that? How would you be here right now? Have you accepted Christ if you weren't seen? You were seen. It's a little fun having this little thing right here, keeping me drinking. Okay, so we know we've got a little Bible history, and we've got Hagar. Hagar is back in the Genesis. It's the Old Testament word. This is the name Hagar. If you don't know who Hagar is, Hagar is the handmaiden to Abraham. Abraham, according to the Jewish faith, and in our word, he is the father of our faith, okay? He is the one who was like, you know what? You know, God tells him, I want you to leave your family. And how many people are like, oh my gosh, I can't leave my mama because mama's the only one who can cook, right? Bless you. Uh, so <laughs> he said to leave that family and to go out and to follow him, right? Go out and start this something new. I'm going to make you a father of nations. And he's like, Abraham's like, I got no children. How can I be a father of nations? And so God had presented and told Abraham and Sarah that they were going to have a son. Well, it's been many, 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 many years. And they are old. I mean, they are old as dusty old, okay? They are old. And, they, <laughs> and so they're like, you know what? He's still got seed. We're going to see if that seed will be fruitful and it will multiply in Hagar. I'm going to give you my handmaiden, Hagar. And Hagar becomes pregnant, Okay? And Sarah is jealous. Let's just put it out there. Sarah May had a great idea, was going to help God out, and she got jealous and mad because of this great idea that became into fruition. And so Hagar feels this contention. She feels this jealousy. So she's going to run out into the desert. She's going, I'm taking this baby. I'm going to just, it's just going to be me and my, let me put it out here. I'm just going to introduce you something about Love Sunday. Children are not a replacement for relationship if that's what you desire, love. 
Okay? Do not put that burden on your child. Okay? That is not a reason to have children. A reason to have children is to be fruitful and multiply. It is something to come in the union of your union together with your spouse. It is not a, rela- a replacement for the love that your spouse isn't giving you. Okay? Put that out there. Don't put that burden on your child. And so what Hagar was going to do is like, I'm going to have this child is going to love me. But she's out there in the desert and she's like thirsty. She's like running in fear. And God sees her and he calls her. He says, hey, girl, where are you going? I didn't tell you to run. I didn't. I, there's still a promise there. You haven't given birth to this child. Why are you going to do this in the desert? Why are you going to do this away from people? Why are you running? I mean, yeah, Sarah was being mean. You know, eventually that they do leave. But here's the thing that I love about God. Genesis 16, 13 says, Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. She wasn't someone that the promise was supposed to come through. But he said, she says, you are the God who sees me. For she said, have I not even here in the wilderness remained alive after seeing him who sees me with understanding and compassion? Things didn't do the way God had planned it to happen. There was, but that doesn't mean that there wasn't something that had come forth. There wasn't still a promise there. What am I trying to say? He's still the God who sees He still saw Hagar. He still had compassion on Hagar, even though it wasn't the plan that he told them it was supposed to happen. See, there's the thing is we can see people and look at people and think about looking at their outward appearance or looking at how they act or the lifestyle they live, and we kind of turn our nose to it. But the thing is, that's still the God who sees. He still sees them. He still loves them. He still has compassion because you know what? He saw me. Because what does Romans 5, 8 says? But clearly God shows and proves his own love for us by the fact that we were still sinners. Christ died for us. He sees me. So I'm going to ask you a question. How can you grow in confidence? How can you grow in confidence? How can you grow in this, this thing that you... I, I don't have the confidence to go out there and, and to talk about my faith. I don't have the confidence to... Pastor Amanda, I know you set up this uh, outreach. It really doesn't matter if I go, right? Lack of confidence. How can we grow in that? You've got to grow in love. Can I show you where we have become love deficit? Can I show you that? How can I show love when I don't feel loved? See, when we're reconciled to our purpose, our heart should be burst with our love for Christ, right? I love Jesus. I just struggle with serving others who aren't like me. I struggle serving outside of my circle. Right? Come on. We did. We struggle with serving outside of that. Uh, John chapter 14, verse 15 says, If you really love me, you will keep and obey my commandments. Ooh. What was the commandment? He tells us in the previous chapter. He even gave us a new one. He says, John 13, 34. I am giving you a new commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. So you too are to love one another. Why was this important to Jesus? Why was this so important to him? He said, it's a new commandment I give you. Why was this important to him? He wants you to see others the way he saw you. He wants you to love the way he loved. And how did he love? We are love deficient because of our own love walk. You're saying, oh, I don't hate anyone. I just love everyone. Can I show you what Jesus said was love? He talked about it when it was his greatest commandment. Matthew 22, 37 through 39. And Jesus replied to him, You should love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. We can do that, right? Because that's just me. That's me and the Holy Spirit. That's just me and God. We are great with just being me. Come on. I'm great if it's just me. Right? But he says the second is like it. 
You shall love your neighbor as yourself, that is, unselfishly seek the best or higher good for others. Love sacrifices. When it's just me, that's not a sacrifice. But when I say I have to love my neighbor to seek the best for them, oh my, me, I have to seek the best for somebody else and not me? Yeah, that's what Jesus said. I have to seek the best and higher good for someone else? That's a sacrifice. So I'm going to ask you, are you looking for opportunities to love? Now, I'm not saying in your own circle, because that's easy. You can do that. But are you looking for opportunities to love outside your circle as a ministry of reconciliation? Who is most important to God? What is most important to God? See, here's the thing. We have a vision statement here at Connect Church. Does anybody know what that vision statement is? We exist to touch the world through our community. Beautiful, right? Eloquent. Wow. But what if we don't, we just say it and we don't do it? We exist to touch the world through our community. We're going to put it on our logos. We're going to put it on our website. Our intention is to have this Christianese saying, but unless we act upon it, it does nothing. Right? Right? See, we're a church that's inside of another building because we decided, Pastor John and I, decided that we needed to stop paying a bill and not sow into our community. I mean, we have to sow in our community. And all we were doing was paying a bill. Okay? We were creating a monument to serve ourselves. And that that is not the reason for the church that is not the reason that Jesus came. He came to reconcile us, right? He says he came to serve, right? So in order to serve, did he say he was going to build this building to house us in? No, he wasn't. Now, we do have a desire for a building. And the thing is, why am I presenting this word? And why don't we have this building yet, Pastor Amanda? You guys have been talking about it. We've got this building fund. And there aren't really a lot of people for, you know, all this, whatever. Well, we've got to get our core heart right. right. Okay? We've got to get our core heart right. We've got to start somewhere. And I'm presenting this word because do you know that the desire that your pastors have is a building that is not just a building for services on Sunday? That's got to pass away. Right. It's not a week-long service. Sir. I'm sorry. No, it's not about just having church. It's not. Because you can't be the church by just going to church. You can't. I'm sorry. That's right. You can't. You've got to reach. So you know what? The first thing we're going to build is not even a building. It's going to be a place for someone to come and to know people. First thing, can't. Wait a minute, we're going to have a church and the first thing we're not going to do is to build a sanctuary? Yes, because that's a monument for you. That's for your comfort. I'm sorry, I'm going to get out of this mold. Okay? That's, that's not what the church is for. The church is, is a ministry of reconciliation. And we can't do that outside of relationship. We can't do that without saying, you know what? I see that you're more important than my seat. Right? Sometimes it's going to be cold. You don't like being cold. I understand. I'm up here and I'm hot. Got some of y'all bundled up, okay? I radiate heat. No, I have not gone through the change. I'm too young for that. But I do. I radiate heat. Uh, so, yes, we have the air on in here. Um, and it's also to keep us from being sick, okay? I love y'all. I don't want to spread germs. Uh, I'll give y'all the science of that if y'all need to. But we exist to touch the world through our community. <clears throat> Do we touch the world through our thoughts? How about praying? Pastor Amanda, I'm called the minister by prayer. Can you touch the world through that? Yes, you can, but I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to challenge you, and that's not the only thing you're called to do. 
How about with our love in action? 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12 says, Keep your behavior excellent among the unsaved. Wait a minute. Who do I need to keep my behavior excellent in front of? The unsaved. The Gentiles. Conduct yourselves honorably with graciousness and integrity. So it's not just when you walk in these doors, it's when you go out these doors. So that for whatever reason they may slander you as evildoers, yet by observing your good deeds, they may instead come to glorify God in the day of visitation when he looks upon them with mercy. Hebrews 10, 24, this is he talking to the church. Let us consider thoughtfully how we can encourage one another to love and to do good deeds. That is what he's called the church to do. We aren't here just, yes, we come in to worship, but if we don't, if we just come and go to church and not the church outside these doors, we're ineffective. We're not doing what God told us to do. We're not calling, doing what Jesus told us to do. It says, I'm fulfilling my calling when I encourage you to serve in your community. I am. I fulfill my calling when I come up here and I encourage you to get in your community and serve. Not just serve here on Sundays, but are you out there serving in your community? Outside of your circle. Okay? That is, let me encourage that. It says, uh, I am fulfilling that calling when I call upon you to meet a need. Yes, we are to serve each other, but not us forget about the ones that need to know that they are seen. They need to know that you're seen. You are seen. Others need to know that they are seen. That is the ministry of reconciliation. See, I'm, I'm presenting these good deeds and all these things. This sounds work-based, doesn't it? Come on. Let me just hear that flesh come up. This is work-based ministry, Pastor Amanda. This is a work-based sermon. No, it's not. Because we're not saved by works. That's true. I, said, I never said we were. Never did. That does not mean we should not look aggressively at how to love others through service. Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 9 says, For it is by grace God's remarkable compassion and favor drawing you to Christ that you've been saved, actually delivered from judgment and given eternal life through faith. And this salvation is not of yourselves, not through your own effort, but is the undeserved gracious gift of God, not as a result of your works nor your attempt to keep the law, so that no one will be able to boast or take credit in any way for your salvation. See, that's not saying that works is bad. That's not what it's saying. That's not what it says for you an excuse of, you know, Pastor Amanda constantly tells us to serve outside of the church, but all she does is talk about that, so all she is is works-based. No, I'm not. I'm love-based. Because I'm going to present to you, probably not going to get it to it this Sunday, I'm going to show you where Jesus tells us to do the exact same thing. And he does it harsher than I could ever say. Ooh, preparing you. He's going to, he's going to step on your toes, not me. All right? But here's the thing. Ephesians 2.10. The next word is for. It means it's a continuation of a thought. For we are his workmanship, his own masterwork, a work of art created in Christ Jesus, reborn from above, spiritually transformed and renewed, ready to be used for good works, which God prepared for us beforehand, taking paths which he set so that we would walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us. Remember, this is an answer for why you are love deficient. There's a reason you are love deficient. This is the answer. George Meyer in her book, Love Revelation, states over and over, indifference makes excuse, but love finds a way. Everyone can do something. We are all called to pray. Okay? This is not your gifting. Ooh, Pastor Manny, you said I am not. That's not a spiritual gift. No, it's not a spiritual gift. I know. It's not listed as one. We are all called to pray. Every one of us. 
This is not a ministry on its own. It is not if we are all called to pray. Ministry of reconciliation is a ministry that we are all called to. It is not a ministry that only a select few are called to pray. It is something that we all call to do. Pastor Amanda, why do we have a group of great people who pray? Because in order for us to get a group here, we have to call it something. That's a man-made thing. Okay? Why is it that there's only people of a certain age that will do it? I have no idea because we're not all being obedient. Let me just say that. Okay? We are all called to pray. So don't get mad at me. Ephesians 6. Who is Ephesians 6 written to? Who is it written to? It's written to the church, right? Okay. It means every one of us who accept Christ as our Lord and Savior. That's who Ephesians 6 is written to. Who is supposed to put on the full armor of God? I am. You are. We all are. Ephesians 6.18 says, With all prayer and petition, pray with specific requests at all times, on all, every occasion, every season in the Spirit. And with this in view, stay alert, all perseverance and petition, interceding a prayer for all God's people. All of us are called to pray. Question again, are you easily discouraged, depressed, filled with self-pity? Mm. Can I encourage you to get active in your pursuit to love who Jesus told you to love? Remember, Jesus came to fulfill the law. And I'm going to read um, Isaiah 58, verse 7 through 12. And I'll close after this. But I want you to see. See, Isaiah was written, you know, it's Old Testament. But a lot of what you see Jesus doing, he he kind of fulfills a lot of what you read in Isaiah. I like reading Isaiah when I go ahead and, and I read it at Christmas about the life of Jesus, right? Because that's who he did. He fulfilled this. But I want you to see something. Remember I said, if you are easily discouraged, depressed, filled with self-pity, can I encourage you to get active in your pursuit to love who Jesus told you to love? It's action. And I'm going to prove it to you here in the Word. Isaiah 58, 7 through 12. It is, not, is it not to divide your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into the house when you see the naked that you cover him and not hide yourself from the needs of your own flesh and blood? Then your light will break out like the dawn. And your healing, restoration, new life will quickly spring forth. Your righteousness will go before you, leading you to peace and prosperity. The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here I am. If you take away from your midst the yoke of oppression, the finger pointed in scorn toward the oppressed or the godly in every form of wicked, simple, unjust speech, And if you offer yourself to assist the hungry and satisfy the need of the afflicted, then your light will rise in darkness and your gloom will become like midday. And the Lord will continually guide you and satisfy your soul in scorched and dry places. See, a lot of times I I, I see this part separated, but it's a a, a connection or that ends. You've got to read everything before it. And the Lord will continually guide you and satisfy your soul and scorched in dry places and give strength to your bones. It will be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. And your people rebuild the ancient ruins. You will raise up and restore the age old foundations of buildings that have been laid for waste. And you will be called repairer of the breach, restorer of streets for dwellings. I like those names. He calls us all by different names. He calls us, I'm going to get a new name when I get to heaven. What name will you get according to how you live this life here on earth? Right? That's that's how we are named. Remember, indifference makes an excuse, but love finds a way. So I'm going to continue on, not next Sunday, but the following Sunday. Does this encourage you to, you know what, God, I, I might be love deficient in an area. Open my eyes on why I am. And be compelled to serve outside of here, outside of your circle. You know what your circle is? Your family. Come on, let's be honest. I don't serve outside of my family because that's my ministry. No, we are called to the ministry of reconciliation. I need to look for opportunities. 
So when I go out every single day and I pray with my boys, God, let us glorify you in whatever we put our hands to. Let me glorify you in the person I speak to today. Let me glorify you. Give me an opportunity to minister to someone today. Not to tell them that they're going to hell, but let them be seen. That's to minister to them. To let them know they have value. To let them know they are important. Because that's who Jesus was. That's what he did. There was never a person that did not come in contact with him that he did not see, that he did not stop what he was doing to meet that need. Pastor Man, are you telling me that's what I'm supposed to do? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. I'm telling you, if you are love deficient, start looking for opportunities actively, purposefully, aggressively. Because we exist to touch the world through our community. It's not a passive statement. It's an active statement. All right. Well, that's all I have for today. Okay. Well, I thank y'all for doing that. It's, um, before we go, I had talked about being seen. And if, you know, we've got anybody here who's like, you know what? I've never heard that before. I've never heard that Jesus sees me, he knows me, and he desires me. And that's the reason he came. Is to restore a relationship. And that's like, you know what, Pastor Man, I don't have a relationship with God like that. And I want one. If that is you, I want you guys, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not like Pastor John, and apparently we had people leave today. Um, I have no idea. Oh, okay, but anyway, so we don't have that beautiful mute music going on, but that's okay. We don't need that because we have the Holy Spirit. But if there is anybody in here who's like, you know what, Pastor Man, I. I need that. Lift your hand real quick. We're all looking forward. There's nobody after you looking back. Anybody need that? It's like, I don't, I don't have that type of relationship. Okay, that's fine. If there's anybody online, you know, we're just going to pray a, a prayer real quick. And, and uh, you know, like I said, my, my breath should be better on next Sunday. I'm up here, though, right? <laughs> so, Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for your son. I thank you that... Whoever needs that relationship right there where they're at, I thank you that they, they just, you know, the first step is, you know, God, I, Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you are the, the son of God that came to earth and died as a man and rose again. I believe in that. I believe that's who you are. But I also believe that I need a heart change. And I thank you that you're the one who's going to do that. I thank you that I'm going to have a heart change. And I'm going to seek more after you. That I've accepted you as my Lord and Savior. That you are, my life starts fresh new today. And that, Father, that, that relationship that I desire, that I'm going to cultivate, that I'm going to, I'm going to find a relationship with other believers. I'm going to get into a group. And I'm going to build and, 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 and fellowship and but fellowship with you above all. And those who direct me towards you, I thank you, Father, that I have that. Lord, I just thank you for, for that new life. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so mine's a little different from Pastor John. Uh, so if, before we go, if y'all would stand, and then we're going to be dismissed. Um, thank you all, like I said, for coming. And those who are connecting online, thank you for connecting. And like I said, it's a little different from Pastor John. I'm not as charismatic as he is, but you know what? I teach the word, and I love the word. So, Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the word that came forth. I thank you that we don't take it lightly, that it didn't just fall on deaf ears. It's not crumbs that are on the ground. But, Father, that it challenged us. It caused us to grow, to know that you see us and you desire us, that you don't want us to be love deficient, yes. that we are loved, that we are desired, that we are seen. Yes. But in order to fulfill that, that fill up that love tank, I've got to look at your created as seen as well. And I've got to have the courage and the confidence to know that whenever I serve another, it's like I'm serving you. Let us know that. That this is a service to you. That's how I love you and I desire you. So therefore, I want to see your created reconciled to you. And I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.